And then, of course, we have the entire insurance industry and the profit versus for-profit discussion. So the hard thing for me to do is to try to opine on whether or not one works better than another, because at the moment we have at least one of everything in the United States today. But we are moving more toward what I think you would all agree would be a much more egalitarian approach to access, to coverage, and the responsibility will be on us as providers and hospitals to make certain that we're providing the outcomes that will be able to be achieved through an appropriate pricing structure when people are allowed to do comparison pricing as they're able to come to various hospitals and healthcare providers for services. At that time, I think we'll be able to make some determination as to whether or not the for-profit versus the not-for-profit argument begins to make sense. Because under market dynamics, we'll be able to see which is beneficial of one over the other. If a patient uh, has a primary care physician in a particular system, either UH or clinic or whatever, and they are hospitalized in a hospital that is not the same affiliate as the primary care physician, which has happened to us and other people I know. So when they're in the hospital that they end up in, which may be close to home, uh, their primary care physician does not have privileges to treat them or see them in another system. Uh, if this is the case, is there any way that it can be opened up so that there's a freedom of uh, interchange of different doctors who go from one system into a practice in another, at least up to a point where the patient is comfortable with their, having their primary physician being able to visit them when they're in another system's hospital? So can anything be done about that, or is that, the way, is that a general condition? Uh, please comment. Yeah, that's generally the way that the healthcare delivery system, the hospital, delivery system in the country works. So physicians, when they complete their training, apply for privileges and membership on medical staffs at any number of hospitals where they would like to provide care. Now, it's very common for physicians today who still see patients in the hospital to limit the number of hospitals that they go to, principally because it's very inefficient and very difficult for them to go to a number of different hospitals to see patients. So as a result, physicians tend to cluster their activities, unless they're very highly specialized. They tend to cluster their activities in a few generally geographically similar hospitals. Now, there is a larger group of uh, physician specialists that are emerging today called hospitalists. So many physicians today are choosing not to see patients in the hospital, but instead will turn over the care of their patients to hospitalists who spend all of their time in a particular hospital and don't have office hours outside of those hospitals. Your question is, is there a way for a physician to be able to see you if you were to go to a hospital in which you were admitted but your physician did not have privileges? There are ways to grant emergency privileges for that to happen, generally for very highly specialty or subspecialized physicians. It's uncommon for primary care physicians to get emergency privileges, although it does happen from time to time. But the reason for that is because hospitals and physicians need to have a clear understanding of their background, their skill sets, their training, their education, the quality of the care that they provide. So generally, there, there will be an emergent type of a relationship that can be established until you can get to the healthcare system or the hospital system in which you would prefer to be admitted. So it's a very rare instance where that would happen for primary care, but it may happen in more specialized services. Mr. Zani, thank you very much for your presentation. And hearing your talk makes us reassured of the leadership in medical and health care we have here in Cleveland with people like you in the leadership. We as, as laymen, though, keep hearing periodically uh, references to the competition between UH and the clinic. Uh, that if one does something, the other won't do it because of that competition. I've heard of that, too. Okay. <laughs> I started to ask, to what extent is that, is there any truth to that? But more importantly, what are examples of where the two of you, as the two largest private employers in this area, are working together? Sure. You know, healthy competition actually benefits everyone. And most importantly, healthy competition benefits the buyer of the service, or in this case, the patients who come to us for care. Competitive environments in capitalistic environments have worked for quite a long period of time and I think we'll continue to do so into the future. 
There are some states, and, and Ohio I believe used to be one of them, that had what were called certificate of need laws. And it used to be that in the past, going back probably uh, 30 years ago, that before you were able to build a hospital, create a service, start a new program, that you would have to go to the state in order to get certificate of need approval to make that happen. That, pro that process would last two, three, four, in some cases nine or ten years. Certificate of need legislation exists in very few places today because it was determined back about 20 or 25 years ago that healthy competition was going to be the best way for health care to be carried out. There's no doubt that this is a very competitive environment for a whole host of reasons. But likewise, we will compete where we must and we will collaborate where we can. So let me talk about what I will consider to be one of the most successful collaborations that we have, and it's including other healthcare systems as well, like SUMA. So we formed an organization back in 2002 called BioEnterprise. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with BioEnterprise, but that money originally came from the Cleveland Foundation, other foundations, university hospitals, the other large health system in town, <laughs> SUMA, Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland State, and others. To me, BioEnterprise, which is led by a fantastic young man by the name of Beju Shaw, has done it a lot to bring invested capital to Northeast Ohio on the basis of our investment in BioEnterprise. In fact, we just recommitted as a group to make certain that BioEnterprise will continue to have a future in our economy. And in fact, the event that was held yesterday that Jan referenced and that I talk about regarding Phillips Global Imaging Center was actually held at the offices of BioEnterprise, including speakers from the major healthcare delivery systems here in Northeast Ohio, as well as Case, uh, Cleveland State University, and others. So to me, that's a wonderful opportunity that we've been able to build on as a collaborative relationship. And then one other final point I'll make is that uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but not-for-profit organizations are just as exposed to antitrust legislation as any other business in the United States. People don't realize that to be the case. So if we're going to grow or expand or provide an additional service or gather additional market share from either of the two major uh, players here in this marketplace, we need to make certain that we stay particularly close to the antitrust legislation because both of us and others have exposure in this regard as well. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Thomas Zenti III, CEO of University Hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Zenti. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.